Good evening. This is John Bennett broadcasting from the wilds of Miami. Tonight we have a good show uh, with uh, Aiden Jacob of San Francisco. Uh, Kristen Chakravarthi Chakra is going to lead, lead the discussion. Um, this is one of, this is the fourth uh, weekly nanomedicine uh, hangout uh, in a continuing series. Hopefully we'll bring some uh, good educational stuff that's kind of fun to present. We have uh, some uh, problems with the uh, audio portion. That's why we're starting a little late. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kristen, and he's going to introduce uh, Aiden and tell you what we're going to do tonight. Okay, Kristen. Okay. Uh, thanks, John. Um, as you know, this is actually our fourth segment of uh, Nano Medicine Weekly. Um, and I'm serving as both your host and the kind of the lead person to guide the discussion tonight. And I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Mr. Aiden Jacob, who has accomplished quite a few things in his life already. And I'm certainly uh, assuming that uh, after tonight's presentation, you're going to see what a smart, uh, intelligent person he is. And he's going to certainly guide us in terms of uh, getting this uh, process underway. I think the first couple segments we were really talking about uh, nanomedicine in both the diagnostic and therapeutic forum. But, but today I'm, I'm very excited to see uh, kind of what he thinks are certain tools that he's been using nanomaterials materials for. Um, so a Aiden is currently at UCSF in Berkeley, um, and he's in, in the California, enjoying the California weather, which unfortunately hasn't been uh, consistent with the East Coast. Um, so I'm going to let Aiden talk. I guess what we're going to do, Aiden, is um, the plan for this segment um, and as kind of hosting this show, what, what I, my objectives were is to certainly open it up to um, uh, the audiences that are going to be twittering specific questions, which John can is as our producer is going to certainly um, uh, interface while we're having this discussion. Um, but I'm going to start kind of let you uh, you know I'll give you some prompts and at any time um, I'm going to try to like interface with you and try to see um, you know if I have any specific questions as you're talking about your research or add points, I, I think it would certainly add to an element of more of an interactive thing. So, um, And then at the end of the segment, uh, we'll do our weekly uh, updates of new research, and certainly we'd love to have your input on um, anything that we've, you know, we've thought that uh, we've collated over the past week of interesting uh, findings in the nanomedicine field. Um, so let's take it away. I mean, I, I think, why don't we start by, you know, I, I think to do justice to all that you've accomplished. Why don't we just give, give us a quick introduction. Tell us about yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you, where you go, kind of a little bit about yourself and background, your education, and certainly what okay. got you in the whole nanomedicine uh, field and its interests. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank John and Christian for uh, inviting me onto the show. This is a great way to, uh, to kind of make a bit of a society for nanomedicine via the Internet, using cyberspace to... You know, get brilliant minds like Christian, CEO of Nano Access, uh, getting people together to talk about how we can use nanomedicine and nanoparticles for a variety of fields and variety of arenas in medicine. So thank you very much for having me. Um, to be quite honest, I'm a bit new to the nanomedicine field, um, particularly because I was able to see with the guidance of my PIs what it is that nanomedicine can introduce to uh, the field of oncology and neuroscience specifically. So uh, prior to coming to the joint UCSF and UC Berkeley Department of Bioengineering and Translational Medicine, uh, I was at the University of Oxford studying radiation oncology on how to use alpha particles and x-rays to treat uh, gliomas, specifically cancer stem cells. And prior to that, I was at the University of Pennsylvania using different biomedical imaging techniques uh, in neuroscience. And the deeper you probe into various diseases of the mind, the brain, the body, you realize that uh, there's going to be a convergence within the next decade between bioengineering and medicine as we know it. You know, basic clinical medicine and bioengineering in specific will come together to create a new platform of how we treat disease and how we approach patients. And that's how I started getting uh, involved with nanomedicine because I think the field of nanomedicine is at the forefront of where bioengineering will take medicine. Sure. Science being at the heart of medicine, 
I think um, we'll be able to use techniques using nanotechnology to uh, improve how we treat patients, how we diagnose patients, and how we view a patient's prognosis over time. Um, with that being said, uh, I think what would be interesting uh, to begin with is to go through perhaps some of the limitations, and I'd love to hear what you have to say as well, um, some of the current limitations we're facing in the field of nanomedicine. So um, although a lot of nanotech medicine uh, research is NIH funded, I think that uh, it's still one of the issues that we face is that it's still in the stage of proof of concept. And I say this in, because even though, you know, we have papers being published from the 1980s where people are uh, theoretically saying that we can use nanotechnology to devise plans for treating certain diseases, um, to get the medical community to buy into actually running full-scale clinical trials or animal trials or to put in grants for the utilization of nanotechnology it's still in the uh, developmental field. I think that's one of the issues. Sure. Uh, what so, do you think I mean, about that, Christian? So, I mean, I, so you're saying that at, at this present moment, you feel a lot of the uh, beneficial effects that uh, nanotechnology could have on patients is kind of uh, limited by the fact that a lot of the stuff is still in the proof of concept. Um, do you... Do you think that that's going to change in the next uh, coming years, or do you still feel as a as a researcher that's actively pursuing, um, you know, development of this technology? What what kind of uh, hindrance are you having in terms of just, or at least in a broad scope, uh, moving your um, technology through that proof of concept pipeline? So what A is finances. We need the NIH to buy into this. But aside from that, if we were talking about strictly med medicine and science, I do believe that, that within the next decade, every field of medicine is going to see how nanotechnology can be affected by the use uh, of nanomedicine. Um, you know, we're talking about things that are a billionth of a meter in size, and we want to be able to prove to basic clinicians, scientists, uh, and people in the hospitals that something that's so small we can inject into the body, we can control it, and it can have a therapeutic and diagnostic effect. And I do see basic scientists as well as physicians um, realizing that they can only push medicine so far without the inculcation of nanomedicine. And that's when you begin to see the biologists or the neuroscientists go over to the lab of someone that's uh, knowledgeable in nanotech and say, how can we incorporate your solutions to my problems? And I think within the next five years or so, we'll be seeing a plethora of publications which have at least tested in animal models the utilization of various nanotechnology models mm -hmm. that can be used, uh, in my opinion, in two basic arenas. A, in the field of the deliverance of chemo agents, and B, in the field of diagnostic, specifically imaging, which is something that we'll touch upon um, later on in the show, I believe. Um, another thing that... Oh, you, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think you bring up an interesting point. And, uh, you know, I, it's interesting because um, I think what you're really getting at is... Uh, really the heart of what translational research is. It's this idea that you're modeling clinical problems in a basic science environment. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of interesting because you, you say that right now there's a lot of discussion about a lot of researchers are finding that the current um, funding environment isn't very conducive to doing a lot of translational research. A lot of the uh, existing grants are drying up. A lot of the you know key investigators or newer innovators that are coming up with new ideas for R01s are just not seeing enough track record or uh, seeing enough feedback from NIH promoting this. Um, exactly. I know that I know that uh, Francis Collins himself has just started a new uh, institute itself within NIH to try to promote drug development. Um, do you see? as a kind of a newer uh, generation science person getting into it, do you feel that um, 
do you have specific ideas on uh, or forums that you think would be better uh, able to get your research out there, or do you still feel um, that you're not getting enough support as a young investigator really getting um, enough interest in your research to really promote it? And as you said, from a proof of concept stage to further along, primarily because of the lack of resources and finances from NIH. Yeah, that's a great question, and I think that the beauty of science is that uh, the proof is in the pudding. So um, we are able to demonstrate, not just myself, other labs around the world are doing great science. There's you know, labs in Brazil and in Barcelona and in Europe and in America that are pushing forth with nanotech. So I don't think that there's a backlash to it because, it, you know, I think we, we can't put, we can't categorize nanomedicine as in the same backlash field as, as we put how Western medicine perceives uh, Eastern medicine. It's not that much of a stretch. The problem that we're facing is that we need more labs to buy into the idea that if you use nanoparticles, you'll get better results. So for example, uh, there were a couple of papers that wanted to show how you can translate using nanomedicine into the operating room. Sure. So one of the issues that one of the issues that surgeons face when trying to resect a brain tumor, for example, is how to do how, how is it that we're able to differentiate between a cancerous cell and a tumor cell? Where do we know where the tumor actually ends and where healthy brain tissue begins? And first, we have to take a step back and realize that this is so important because uh, certain brain tumors are able to recap recapitulate at an exponential growth rate. So if the brain surgeon's going in for an eight-hour surgery and resecting this tumor, and he leaves 10 to the eighth of a glioma cell or a glioma stem cell in there, in five years, that tumor will be back. So it's very important to be able to differentiate between where is the tumor cell and where, where is the healthy tissue cell? So there are other techniques um, other than nanomedicine, but one of the arenas that nanomedicine brings to the operating room is by the use of uh, cadmium selenide. Um, it allows you to actually make the tumor glow in the dark mm -hmm. by using a UV light, and this allows the surgeon to be able to cut the exact perimeter of the tumor out from the base of the brain. So again, you're injecting this uh, nanoparticle into the brain. Obviously, it's very complex, mm -hmm. but the end result is that you turn the operating room into a translational medicine arena where you see nanotechnology illuminating only the cancer cells. You turn on a UV light, and the brain surgeon is able to remove the tumor and know that anything that's not glowing does not have that nanoparticle attached to it and hence I should leave it in and vice versa for the removal of the tumor. So that's an example of where nanomedicine is actually being used in an operating room. Right and, and it's interesting you bring that uh, topic up because I, you know we, we had mentioned in a previous show about what I think the specific nanomaterial discussing is quantum dots uh, which are typical CAD selenide materials and I think uh, especially with head and neck tumors, I think you have a unique situation because a lot of the pushback, um, as we were discussing previously, is that there hasn't been enough studies looking at the long-term outcome of these nanomaterials on um, specifically in terms of a side effects, in terms of leaving these materials in, right? So that it sends a sense of um, kind of reluctance to seeing a lot of this going into a commercial platform primarily for that reason. But I think maybe, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, possible suggestions is, and it certainly would be interesting to see, whether tumors that can be excised um, once they're actually mapped by using these quantum dot materials, um, that might have a more of a clinical application. And if you're suggesting that it's currently being used in the operating room, that might bring upon more public awareness that, you know, these materials aren't so... Um, "Quote unquote toxic or dangerous to the host after yeah. introduced it." Yeah, that's a great point, Krishnan. So, one of the issues uh, that we have with the conventional chemotherapeutic um, plan for treating patients is toxicity, and basically that means, you know, we're going to be giving this patient a ton of drugs to kill their tumor, but 
but we're also killing healthy tissue. We're also causing between, a study came out recently that uh, patients with head and neck cancers will have about twenty to thirty thousand dollars in bills not for treating their cancer but for treating the side effects of their chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. So the problems that we're having currently with the drugs is that A, are we reaching the tumor directly? No, because we have poor specificity and we have dose limiting toxicity. Whether we're giving these chemotherapeutic drugs orally or via an IV route. So now comes in someone like yourself at Nano Access and you say, you know, we can solve this problem. How can we solve this problem? Well, we can devise a technique in which we use a nanoparticle to coat a chemotherapeutic agent. You know, for example, for head and neck tumors, you can use cisplatin. For breast cancer, you can use doxorubicin. What have you per the, per the cancer that you're trying to attack. And because certain types of nanoparticles can be geared with, for example, a magnetic field, we can then direct the nanoparticle directly to the tumor and then allow the drug to be disposed within the tumor without giving toxicity to the body. Now let's touch upon a bit how this actually works on the biochemical level without getting uh, too deep into it. Um, There are a lot of ways in which a cancer cell differentiate themselves from usual cells. One of those are the unusual cell surface receptors that the cancer cells have, cell surface markers. And throughout the years, this is what basic science researchers have been identifying, that X cancer has a specific cell surface receptor. And they're trying to make chemotherapeutic agents that attack those, specifically those cells. But it hasn't really been working too much because we're causing this vast amount of toxicity to other organs in the body. So what we, what we can now develop is in the lab, we can generate a nanoparticle, for example, made out of iron oxide. And we can make it in such a manner that it is specifically targeted to the unusual cell surface receptors of those cancer cells. Then the nanoparticle can be guided, for example, by a magnet or some other uh, valid device to specifically gear itself towards those cells and via receptor mediated endocytosis these cells can uptake the nanoparticles now this now the question is the nanoparticles in the cancer cell and the nanoparticle contains within it the drug but now how do we get the drug into the cell if it's in the nanoparticle so we lucked out by nature being that the lysosome within the cancer cell is able to get the chemicals within the nanoparticles to be released and this is simply because of the pH level the low pH level from the lysosomes are able to cause the nanoparticles to release the chemo agent into the cell thereby killing the cell you're killing the tumor you're directing it specifically to the cancer cell and you're saving the patient tens of thousands of dollars on side effect treatments on chemotherapeutic agents and you're possibly extending their quality of life for a long term of years but as you were saying taking this concept to the NIH or taking this concept to clinical trials is going to be something that might take decades but it's great to see that it's the momentum is building because we have this vast amount of biotechnology coming in and we're not talking about you know moving arms and limbs from across the country mm-hmm. we're not talking about com- brain computer interface we're talking about making simple nanoparticles that can take a chemotherapeutic drug put it in a iron oxide nanoparticle inject it into someone's body and get that tumor shrunk without affecting the rest of the body and i think that's something that speaks to oncologists, radiologists, radiation oncologists, med- medical practitioners of, of all fields. Yeah, and I, I think we, you know, certainly um, one of the things to impress upon is again the idea that um, you know you said it yourself, right? The the cost that it typically takes for patients. To deal with the side effects of chemotherapies around twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. Now right. imagine those cost savings being invested in developing these nanomaterials where 
you know, again, I, I always make this point, and I had made this in a previous show. Till today, you know, the cosmetic industry is one of the most unregulated industries in terms of use of nanomaterials in their products. And the, expect the expectation that, you know, uh, life science applications, especially uh, drug applications, where the benefits for um, something as acute as a very aggressive stage four cancer, where you're not really worried about so much long-term toxicity issues, um, it's, it's kind of compelling that, you know, we haven't seen more of this stuff commercialized already, where the benefits could really outweigh the um, potential long-term risks from these materials for the fact that they haven't been tested. Um, you know, it's you know you're looking at increasing a patient's lifespan anywhere. So let's say from six months to a year to something way you know much more, uh, you know five years or ten years, whatever it is. Um, it's surprising that not a lot of this stuff has really made it to clinical use as a, as more aggressively. Yeah, I I agree. 100% and I think uh, and it, there are two things to say about that. One is um, I think it's nice to know that the field of nanomedicine isn't being met with aggression but it's kind of being met, it's being met with skepticism but with open arms in the sense that you know show us the science and data is being published to prove these things. Um, there are labs probably at every fine university now that incorporate nanomedicine and in addition to that uh, I'll give you another example of why I think nanomedicine will end up taking off within the next decade is because it can be used in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you another two more examples. One example is for imaging. Um, currently, we want to find better contrast agents for MRI imaging, specifically for the brain. We want to be able to evaluate the blood flow that's going around the blood-brain barrier. If you have a tumor that, it's ne that sits next to the blood-brain barrier, we want to be able to use a specific MRI contrast agent to evaluate the aberration of the blood-brain barrier. Now, we can use nanotechnology to incorporate specific contrast agents that are much better and more specific than the ones we particularly have now to determine what's actually occurring inside of the person's head uh, because of a stroke, because of a tumor, because of ischemia, um, or because of just a typical injury. So beyond therapeutics, um, I think nanotechnology will be able to enable the fields of diagnostics and uh, the detection of disease at an earlier stage. That's one, one arena that I think will, will speak to the heart of medicine. Mm -hmm. um, a second arena, which I think is already quite popular, but actually did take time for the biomedical community to accept is regenerative medicine. We have two areas in the central nervous system that we're particularly interested in focusing on in terms of regenerative medicine. One is uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. We want to figure out a way to how do we regenerate these specific neurons. We know where these neurons are going haywire. We know where they're dying, but we don't know how to get them to regenerate. Secondly, um, central nervous system uh, injuries, specifically spinal cord injuries. It is, it, it, it's very saddening to see a person, let's say a 20-year-old, fall off a motorcycle, you know, rupture his spine and for it to never be able to work appropriately again and him be paralyzed. Yeah. Now one of the things we're trying to do in regenerative medicine is to use stem cells to regrow those areas of the brain or the spinal cord that have been injured. But probably one of the most, one of the greatest challenges that the biomedical community faces is that how do we get the stem cells to migrate specifically to the area that we want them to be and then for them to get comfortable in that new environment and for them to regenerate in that new environment and to inculcate and become one with the environment which we need them to grow. So uh, there was there's a professor that published a paper, uh, I believe his name is Weber, and mm -hmm. he showed that you can use nanoparticles mm -hmm. to guide stem cells and to track them specifically throughout various areas in the spine and the brain and to allow them to inculcate in the environment that we want them to. 
Now, without nanomedicine, without this technology, we wouldn't be able to do that. Right. So here we have, we've already highlighted four arenas of medicine that are affected by nanomedicine. We have chemotherapeutic interventions mm -hmm. and the decrease of cost. We have radiological imaging, MRI contrast imaging. We have surgical procedures in the OR. And now we even have regenerative medicine. And I'm sure the list can go on and on. But so, these are four basic arenas that I think are going to develop within the next decade or so and prove to the biomedical community, to physicians and scientists alike, that nanomedicine is not only a, an additive luxury for a patient, but should become a required necessity for the treatment of a patient. No, it's a... It's a very fair assessment. I mean, um, do you think that um, there is, you know, I, I can certainly uh, probably um, feel, make this more of a, I guess, a, a more of a kind of a more issue at this point. Do you think that, going back to your original uh, statement, that a lot of this current discovery and findings are in proof of concept? Do you think that a part of the reason why uh, it's still a proof of concept is primarily due to a lack of industry involvement in seeing some of this technology take the next step? Or do you think it's a functional limitation of the science itself that hasn't really uh, brought industry as aggressively towards getting this stuff commercialized? Yeah, Christian, that's a great point. So we got to keep in mind that as much as industry... Uh, is interested in helping science grow, mm -hmm. their main interest is money. Their main interest is, you know, we're going to invest $100, billion, uh, $100 million in a clinical trial. And we're going to do that based on years of science telling us that at the end of the day, we're going to make, we're going to get a return on our investment that's exponentially greater. So companies like Medtronic or Genentech or things of that sort, they want to see the basic science before they, you know, plumb it in with hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, what I do think is by having these little startup companies or a company as yourself, NanoAccess, and then laboratories funded by the NIH or through university systems, inculcating nanotechnology, I think it's going to start, those groups are, they're going to start producing data that nobody can turn a blind eye to. And once that data b starts to come to surface, industry will end up approaching those labs themselves and saying, give us a piece of the action. Because I personally believe that the future is nanomedicine and nanotechnology and that medicine as we know it is going to be revolutionized by these bioengineered solutions. Mm -hmm. And we all know that the only way to get over the hump is by getting backed by industry. The NIH, you know, they could help, but to the point of getting something commercialized, mm -hmm. you're going to need a, a, a big industry partner to help push it to the next level because running a clinical trial is just way too much money. With that being said, though, there are studies that already are, are already being done outside of the United States using nanotechnology and chemotherapeutic agents together to treat various types of tumors. But those aren't in the US. So one of the one of the questions from a health economic standpoint is as a startup company, do you want to take your technology to Europe first where the regulations are lower mm -hmm. and then, you know, kind of run it out and see where you can tweak it here and there and then bring it back to the US? Or do you want to go through this pretty much five to ten year long regulatory cycle with the FDA in the US, get approved, raise hundreds of millions of dollars, and then have that backing to go to the to other markets like Japan, Asia, Europe, etc. And that's something that I think each startup is gonna have to ask themselves once they develop this technology. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because, you know, I, I certainly can comment on that. A lot of uh, industry concerns is where the biggest market value is for a lot of this technology. And unfortunately, 50% of the world's market is within the U.S. Um, you know, you, a great example of this is you look at generics uh, for pharmaceuticals. They, they are definitely aggressively trying to get into the U.S. market and 
uh, getting a lot of the drugs that are being uh, made in the generic market here. But again, stiff regulatory FDA requirements are making it very difficult. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think there, there is definitely a component of appreciation that, uh, you know, when you put out the numbers statistically, they say that if you look at a drug to market, the average cost that a pharmaceutical company actually incurs is close to about $800 million by the time they take a drug from proof of concept through uh, phase one through four clinical trials. So certainly I think, you know, it would be nicer to see some of this technology more rapidly accelerated through the commercial pipeline, but uh, I can certainly see in about 15 to 20 years a lot of this stuff coming to fruition, hopefully. If not in the U.S. market, certainly in other markets that eventually come back into the U.S. So, so Krishnan, you think that this is going to take about 15 to 20 years to get it at least going at a faster rate in the U.S.? Yeah, you know, like, like I said, it, you, you, if you think about it, um, you know, from a perspective of industry, most times that you see a lot of the biggest issues that um, current industry is having is they're the gap gap stop between somebody who has created a proof of concept in a lab to something that is uh, sellable in a market. Um, and I bring that up because a lot of the stuff, you know, when you look at the concerns, and this is a very good point, is when you're when we talk about technology and what it can do when we publish a manuscript versus when you talk about technology when you're looking at industrial scaling you know, you become the, the components of how does a price structure play into it? What are the costs for large-scale manufacturing that makes it feasible? How can you have consistent manufacturing of these materials? All these concerns really have not been addressed. And primarily, again, it's a matter of there hasn't been enough, um, there hasn't been enough, enough companies in the space itself. Certainly, you know, we're trying to bridge that gap. But... Uh, the other aspect of it is that there isn't enough funding to take, uh, especially with life science applications, to get to a point where you have data as a phase one clinical trial where a company raises anywhere from 40 to $80 million that's proving in a phase one uh, trial that's looking at specific patient populations and then segueing that into getting a, uh, a big company like GlaxoSmithKline or Genzyme or uh, some of the big pharma to back the rest of the clinical trial. So it's it's unfortunate. It, it's un and you know maybe it's an issue of awareness. Maybe it's an issue of educating uh, the right players that these are the issues between where nanotechnology and nanomedicine is and where it could be if that gap is really filled. Yeah, I think that's a great point because what we're seeing is uh, we're not introducing. Um, you know, one of the things that you learn in translational medicine or health economics is that are you introducing a new, uh, an additive field, meaning are you just, you know, adding another chemotherapeutic agent, are you just making another type of pacemaker or another electrode, or are you creating an entirely new arena? And I think that the issue with nanotechnology is we're creating a brand new arena, we're revolutionizing medicine as we know it, and we need to make sure that these nanoparticles, you know, they don't go against uh, the laws of physics in the body. Um, you know, they they use the energy that, it, you know, for example, there are a lot of biomechanical, electromagnetic, and thermal uh, issues that have to be addressed in the nanoparticle world for it to be accepted as a drug. And in order for industry to buy into that, this has to be proven prior to them putting up a hundred million dollars. So I think that then becomes a difficulty for a company because they then have this responsibility of, okay, we need to go prove that this bioengineered device uh, might be biodegradable or we can build a filter to get it out of the system of the patient or we can prove that, you know, it's, it's not toxic for the patient. But we have to prove something so that industry will buy into this concept and end up funding it. In addition to that, uh, the nanotechnology fields are going to be segmented by what their target is. I think that in 10 years or so, we'll be seeing companies that are, you know, nano-oncology versus nano-orthopedics versus, you know, nano-cardiovascular. I don't think we're going to see 
until a big company jumps in and eats the market, I think we're going to be seeing a bunch of little companies building up uh, with the little funding that they have how to attack a specific disease in a particular manner with perhaps a patented nanoparticle that they've invented in their lab. And I think the IP landscape for nanoparticle development is also huge because if you develop a manner by which you can attack a certain tumor uh, with positive results, you're going to have to get that patented in some way to protect your company. Um, and that's surely because of you know the business behind the medical market. Um, so I think it's it, beyond the convergence of bioengineering and medicine, nanotechnology is just infused with this multi-layered onion of complexities that need to be addressed from industry to you know clinicians, translational medicine, and basic science. But I do think, I don't know what the timeline is going to be, but I do think that this might be the standard of care when that realization comes. One quick question, uh, Aiden. Um, yes. What area of medicine do you see that's closest to being used clinically in nanomedicine? What, is there any particular field that it's kind of close to being applicable clinically? What ty I didn't hear you 100%, but I think you said you what type asking, of... He was asking what in, if, if we were to uh, look at the different potential applications for nano, nanotechnology in a clinical setting, what, which one would you foresee um, this technology affecting the soonest or uh, earliest? Oncology? It sounds like oncology. I think interventional radiology. Okay. Um, I could be biased because I'm, I work in that area, but I'll tell you why. Um, we need to get these particles to the tumors. We need to get these chemo agents to the tumors. I mean, cancer, today we had in the BBC, cancer is a worldwide epidemic. You know, it's just, it's growing and growing and growing, and what we have to fight it uh, might be clever, but not clever enough. And nature is pretty much kicking our butts in beating us with cancer. Um, and being that interventional radiologists are very early adapters of new technology, you know, anywhere from radio ablation to various types of interventional procedures, you know, throughout the brain or the arteries of the heart, etc. I think they would be interested in using nanotech uh, to get to those tumors. I also think from a economic standpoint and an industry standpoint, uh, interventional radiologists might be the way to uh, promote this because the platform is built. Um, and what I mean by that is we can use the technologies that are already used in interventional radiology to now incorporate nanotechnology, meaning you can put a nano, uh, you can essentially make a nano catheter. You can use your catheter that you would deliver a chemotherapeutic drug, but now use that catheter to deliver a nanoparticle containing a chemotherapeutic drug. Um, so I think that's uh, that's a specific area that I'm particularly interested in and excited about to see. Uh, and then radiology in general, as we spoke about, Christian and I spoke about before, using nanotechnology to give off specific types of contrast agents mm -hmm. that will allow for better imaging techniques, diagnostics, and to detect disease at an earlier stage. So I think those two arenas will be early adapters of this technology. We have a couple questions here from the Twitterers, if you guys have time. Do you want to do it now? Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay, one person, I think you may have partially answered this, uh, Aiden. Uh, is, the, is the research out there being, being done uh, mostly funded by the government or private, private uh, industry? Uh, I think Krishnan, being a CEO of a company, might be better equipped to answer this. I'll just say that in 2004, the National Cancer Institute uh, created the Alliance for Nanotechnology and Cancer, but I wouldn't bet that there's too much money hanging in there for companies like NanoAccess. But I'll let, yeah, let's look. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I think the, the funding environment has certainly... Um, the landscape for getting anything funded nowadays with NIH is very difficult. I mean, it almost, again, these quote-unquote uh, small business innovation research grants that they typically issue out, again, they're, you know, the 
the data itself, you almost have to prove the concept even before you get some of the funding through NIH at this point. So it's really segues into um, favoring bigger businesses that have established revenue streams and established pipeline of products that they're already into the market. So it's a it's a very tough climate. I mean, I think anytime you're a small to medium sized business operating in uh, pharmaceutical and healthcare industry, it's a very it's a much more difficult challenge than if you were in any other industry, especially because of the cost associated with uh, a lot of this stuff getting into a clinical trial or that type of pipeline. But and, and no uh, returns, right? What's what's the next question, John? Uh, the next question is I think you probably answered it. Uh, how do you tag drugs? So they go to tumors and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. What was the question? How do you what drugs? How do you tag drugs? How do you you mentioned tagging drugs? So if they go to tumors or, or areas where you want the drugs to go to, mm -hmm. what is the mechanism mechanism of tagging the drug? So I'm not sure what exactly what they mean, and Christian jump in here, um, but yeah, sure. okay. Base so go ahead, Christian. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, I think that what they're specifically looking at is, you know, as, um, as kind of in, in a similar previous example that we were discussing, a uh, lot of the nanomaterials themselves, because they're made of uh, cadmium and selenite, some of the heavier metals, uh, they, pro they pose unique chemistry profiles on their surface that allows you to bioconjugate them to antibodies and different drugs. Um, so once you have the conjugation process actually happening, then the the actual nanoparticle serves as a carrier at that point or an optical probe per se or what we coin uh, commonly term theranostic particle which is both a therapy and diagnostic particle in one um, so it's really a combination of chemistry that is the at the heart of conjugating any nanomaterial to a drug um, but you know it, it's again the the beauty of it is exactly that you know when you start to look at the actual chemistry uh, you appreciate how it's such an interface in multiple disciplines because certain drugs are going to be have a certain molecular weight that's going to not make it very conducive for binding to materials uh, such as quantum dot or um, you know other types of nanoparticles so I think it's uh, really an appreciation for how a very few sciences are in a sense as multidisciplinary as I think nano nanotechnology and nanomedicine is compared to some of the more pure sciences like uh, heavy chemistry, et cetera. So uh, certainly any future possibilities of new innovations is going to start at a very interdisciplinary approach between scientists, chemists, doctors, et cetera. So, right, and I would just, I would quickly add to that uh, for the Twitter viewer that um, they might be interested in looking at a paper by Robert Langer out of MIT in which uh, he spends a couple of papers discussing this in great detail, just what Krishna was talking about, how uh, the dynamics of you know, chemistry, magnetism, and weight have to do with how we will get these nanoparticles to deliver the appropriate uh, agent to the target. Uh, so Robert Langer out of MIT. You know, uh, this, is, this is a new tech, uh, Aiden, I'm going to type it in the tweet right now. Robert Langer, read Robert Langer. Correct. Robert Langer of MIT. Yeah, he used uh, nanoparticles um, to get them to tumors. They entered the cell and they gave over specific chemotherapeutic agents. And I believe the uh, the That's nanoparticles right. were coated with uh, polyethylene polyethylene glycol. Yeah, it's um, PEG. It's typically uh, increases their circulation times in the actual bloodstream. Um, yeah, Robert Langer is an excellent resource. Actually, yeah, he comes. He's out of MIT. Um, almost. Very innovative gentleman, um, very profound. So. I think another thing that, uh, in terms of what types of nanoparticles to use, something that's coming up more in the uh, in the literature is the utilization of uh, superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting about about uh, Fe three o four is that scientists want to use it as a contrast agent in imaging particularly because it has uh, a better half-life than the conventional contrast agents that are being used uh, gadolinium so I think that's something that also people might want to look up as to why we use certain types of nanoparticles as a conjugate with certain types of chemo agents 
Very good. Okay, gentlemen, maybe uh, now would be a good time to go over some articles that are written about sure. uh, the topic of nanotechnology. And uh, Kristen and Aiden, you can just jump. I'll show you some. This is a new yeah, thing. Do you, we're John, doing. Do, you want, do you think we should give this? Uh, I know that Aiden had uh, come up with a very interesting um, visual uh, video. I, I think it might be very interesting for audiences to take a look at. Do you want me to attempt yeah. to? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, let's Let attempt to do that. Go I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna narrate this in the background while Krishnan brings this up. Uh, you gotta you gotta bear with me, uh, Aiden. I'm just going to try to get this to work. Um, yeah, of course, go for it. Uh, I'm just gonna tell the viewers basically what this video that Krishnan's bringing up is gonna show. Hopefully, we can get it up. It's a short two-minute YouTube video in which I wanted to illustrate to the audience, um, particularly how a theoretical nanoparticle would get. Andy, can you, site. Do you, uh, sorry to interrupt. Do you do you mind by just telling me the uh, uh, the you, name? Yeah, I think it was nanotechnology, uh, nanoparticle drug delivery in cancer therapy. We'll play the Jeopardy theme while we're waiting. All right, um, we're going to try to do the screen share right now. Okay. okay, great. Let's do it. Do you guys see it? Not quite yet. No, yeah, okay, got you got it. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Not quite. You're getting a picture, Aiden? Uh, I can't get the picture. Well, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll just put that screen on. Okay. Can you see anything, Aiden? No, I'm not getting a picture. Uh, we're, not, we're not getting a picture at all. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, there, there we go. There we go. go. There, there we go. go. There there go. go. All right, yeah. leave it. Leave it. That's great. There we go. So, we Dr. Rubison. Dr. Rubison is a... Uh, a youth. Oh, let's see. <laughs> Are you guys still seeing it? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Krishnan. Yeah. Still, um, you guys able to visualize the video? Yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah, you can see it well.
Yeah, that was just a quick summary that we wanted to show the audience in regards to what we've been speaking about for them to visualize what it might potentially mean to introduce a chemotherapeutic agent coated with nanotechnology and delivering it specifically to the tumor site. So thank okay. you, Krishnan, for getting that up. No problem. So at, at this point, I, I think what we, uh, Aiden, would typically do how we end the show with our guest is um, John pulls up some interesting findings about five, ten minutes. Um, certainly we could, uh, you know, both of us can comment on those findings and see if there's anything interesting that we could discuss. But uh, the last piece of the show work whereby we look at the week's uh, developments in the field that uh, we could educate the public on. So John, uh, shoot us some titles and we'll see what we can... Uh, okay. Let me try to screen share what I got here. Let me know when you see the screen. Can you see the screen? Uh, you see the screen now? Uh, yeah. Uh, Christian? Yep. I see your screen, yeah. Yep. Okay, now this is a new feature, Christian and uh, Aiden. Uh, what I can do is show you the titles, and you guys just determine which topic you want to discuss. These are all articles from the last couple of days in nanomedicine, so take your pick of which ones you think you have something to comment on. I Go ahead, Aiden. Krishnan, go ahead. I think the, the one on the bottom of the screen might fit well with your orthopedic thing in uh, oh, general access. Right. Right. Novel yeah. nanoparticles particles uh, developed. You know, I, actually, I actually was thinking we could wrap up that one, uh, the show with the one that will Google make waves in nanotechnology next, and I think that's certainly... Yeah, yeah, let's let, me, let, me open, let me open yeah, that you know, page. And I think that's, that's going exactly the lines of what we were kind of discussing today, is our bigger businesses going to think about investing in um, in this type of technology. Oh yeah, that would, you see, so having something, having a company like Google back up nanotechnology would push nanotech to the future because you basically, you have someone perhaps even above industry backing the future. That's right. Um, because you, usually the, uh, the uh, investments of Google don't go haywire. And if uh, Genentech sees Google backing you know, a company with nanotech, perhaps they'll also get involved. Um, Christian, what do you think about that idea? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. You know, for me, this is kind of exciting because, as you said, you have a, a industry giant that believes in this technology. And if they, as you said, if their uh, perspective is this type of stuff can uh, certainly make a huge impact, I think, um, you know, it's, it's only going to be a matter of time before, before the investment community really starts to put uh, serious funding and more early stage uh, ideas. So this is a really nice article, actually. Great article. I'd be happy to see Google invest a billion dollars in this area. <laughs> Specifically in nano access. I, I yes. <laughs> yes. I'll vouch for okay, that. Okay, very good. Very good, gentlemen. Any, any closing right, so, remarks that you have to say? No, I, I think, John, this was a really nice show. We want to thank Aiden for uh, coming My on. My pleasure. And, thank you uh, very much for having me. Yep, and uh, next week we have a very special guest uh, coming in from University of Miami who's going to be talking about uh, microdermal uh, nanoparticles for skin cancer treatment. Um, so I look forward to having all of you join us next week, and uh, thank you for participating in Nanomedicine Weekly. Have a good night. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Take care. Have a good night. Good night, right. gentlemen. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank good night. you.